Well, to kick off the year 2023, we have yet another full build, backed by popular harassment, Demon Slayer. Enjoy! We first begin by scrounging around and finding some 19th and 18th century wrought iron as our starting material for the clad of the actual blade. Wrought iron contains in it a whole bunch of impurities that needs to be squeezed out and the material homogenized further. It is easy to make something wrought iron when it's this big, but as soon as you stretch it and make it wide, all the impurities become bigger and bigger and create weld flaws. So I will have to stack and fold a whole bunch of my wrought iron to make it much more refined. In the anime as well as in the manga, the sword shape is closer to a traditional Japanese kitchen knife rather than an actual sword or an axe. So we're going to use a set of appropriate techniques to make a giant kitchen knife that's also a sword. Even for a pop culture project like this, I prefer to use traditional methods and techniques. One of the reasons for that is, and the main reason, is that I dedicated most of the years of studying bladesmithing to learning the way the old school operated. And I try to keep that tradition alive even here. The benefit of working with wrought iron in knife making is not that it makes a superior knife, it's not that it is accessible, it is not. The benefit of working with wrought iron is that it is a completely beautiful material that has been made by blacksmith's hands a century or more ago and now you're giving it a new life and a new form and reveal the fingerprints of previous craftsmen.
Once the wrought iron is refined enough, I make a square billet and set it aside a little bit. Then I select my high carbon steel that will be inserted and forge welded into the wrought iron in the standard hot dog in a bun technique. You have seen it enough in kitchen knife making and in fact the same technique applies in Japanese swords except for the carbon content of the relevant materials is reversed. This and similar techniques of making a knife or a sword is called sanmai technique. San means three and mai generally means layers or pages in a book. Once the billet is fully welded and the high carbon is attached to the wrought iron, it's time to forge it out into a preform. Mind you, because our billet is so thick, it will move differently on the bottom versus the top side of the power hammer due to effects of cooling of the bottom die and basic gravity. So I have to alternate it and rotate it at all times to keep the high carbon centered. You'll notice during this blade forging, not only does Ilya use a bunch of different dies under the power hammer, but he also likes to use a handheld top tool that mimics the striking of a hand hammer. Also, he does a lot of hand forging. Seems as though a somewhat forgotten practice in modern bladesmithing is just that, smithing the blade. Forge the blade all the way to shape. Act as though there is no power tools after the forging to remove material other than a file and some sanding stones. Put yourself in a mindset as if the grinders don't exist. With that said, grinders do exist, so let's go ahead and use one. All right, now that our blade has been forged and it's had some cold planishing done to it to do the initial straightening, it is wrought iron after all, so you can do a lot of cold planishing after it's completely cooled down after the forging. It's now time to start beginning the grinding. Now, we're going to heat treat this blade basically as is. My initial goal is just to get all the profiles put in, grind some off here, get our edge nice and straight. This little notch here that's forged in is going to be the indication of where we're gonna put in the little scoop 
We'll do that before heat treating as well, but for now, let's go ahead and get to grinding. At this point, I've done most of the rough grinding by eye, just using my eyeball to figure out where some of the metal needs to go, and I'm pretty good at this. But now we need to start mapping out where specific things on the blade exist, such as the hole in the center, and exactly how the shoulder of this blade exists. These big build videos take a lot of time and a ton of effort, and we take our own personal work time off to make them for you. So if you want to help support us, then be sure to subscribe to this channel. That works. Once all the final forging is done, the initial grinding is complete, it's time to heat treat the blade. In order to do that, we're using the gas forge and using the flame to heat up the piece evenly. And then we're going into water because that is the traditional way of heat treating a Japanese kitchen knife. Grinding big blades like this are always a challenge, however this really is just a large kitchen knife. And because of its size it does present some challenges, but in general I'm just going to grind this and approach it exactly like I would an actual knife blade. I just have to be a little more careful. Now that the blade is heat treated and in Matt's hands, it's time to work on the fittings. Well, let's start with the tsuba. Uh, tsuba in traditional Japanese uh, koshirai is done from varying materials, starting from lacquered leather all the way up till silver and gold, and all materials in between. In our case, we're choosing iron. Uh, the reason why I chose iron is because it tends to be one of the more durable sort of materials. Now, we will have to brass brush it later. However, I start out with forging the tsuba and unlike the traditional technique, I am punching the nakago ana or the tang hole uh, using hot forging. Why? Because I like forging. The tsuba rim has a fairly complicated shape, which is further exacerbated by the fact that it has a raised border that I interpret as standard tachi-like copper rim, which I will have to make separately. I've never made that part before in making anything Japanese, so that's going to be somewhat of a struggle. First, I cut out a strip of copper of the uh, approximate circumference of where the tsuba rim would be. Then I dish it out, making it into a furrow, and start slowly curling it until the two ends touch. Once they touch, I clean them up and solder them, 
creating a ring or a bracelet-like shape. After that, I squeeze the tuba inside of it and punch in the corners, thereby trapping it. Once the corners are punched in, like that, I start working the entire rim until the tuba is trapped. At this stage, it's a relatively loose inside, and the reason is, as you work the copper, it conforms and tries to escape any tension. So I have to continuously work on the tuba, including setting it in the pitch pot, in order to make the copper rim fairly tight and even. In the source material, this blade has a very cartoony, squiggly line that defines the scaled area from the polished section of the edge. Now, one of the biggest challenges in making anime art or cartoon art into real life pieces is the decisions that go into making it. Do we add that exaggerated cartoony line to the blade where we just mask it off and paint it like some other people would? Or do we show you the realistic way that a sand mine knife would have been polished? And that's what we decided to do. You're still gonna get a definitive line between those two areas, the scaled area and the polished area, except this time it's gonna be a little less exaggerated and still very, very cool. Because in our case, the sword is so massive in terms of the amount of mass and where the stress points are, it is actually fairly inappropriate to use the traditional tsuka or handle construction that you will find on katanas. Uh, the, one of the number one reasons are that we need a counterbalance to such a massive blade. So instead of doing the very standard and traditional fushi and kashara setup, I'm going to use forgeable bronze and start making them as if I'm making them for a western kitchen knife or a bowie knife. After the rough shaping of the Fushi and Kashiri is completed, it's time to take them in into the jewelry workshop and do some carving and chasing to refine all the lines to make them look closer to the source material. The cool thing about forgeable bronze is that it's... Forgeable? Yes, that is correct. Means I can heat it up, punch the slots into it, forge it into the shape I want, snug it up into the tank while it's hot, and get a perfect fit. So at this point, all of my grind lines have been going this way from the spine to the edge of the blade. Now to give it a very finished look, we have to transition and make all of that grit go linearly from the actual shoulder of the blade all the way to the point. I'm gonna do a little bit of that on the grinder, but really the only way to achieve that and to achieve the nice handmade look that this sword deserves is hand sanding.
Most of the times in Japanese swordsmithing, the smith is not the person who is polishing the blades. And once the blade is forged, it is handed over to a professional polisher. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, fellow YouTubers, members of the ABS, and my fellow Americans. Here I am, finding myself once again hand sanding on one of Ilya's blades that he's forged. However, I have zero intentions on putting my name on it or submitting it of any kind. Hello? No, no, no. No, I'm just hand sanding a blade for a video project. It's just for a video project. I'm not submitting it at all. No, I forge every blade that has my name on it. Yeah, yeah sorry for the confusion. In the source material on the tube, you notice cross-like shapes. I interpret those to be the artist's uh, version of the standard Tachi Sepa that sometimes cover the entire tube. I make them out of copper as well because some of the source material shows them blackish or reddish black and some of the source material shows it as pink. So patinated copper kind of brings both worlds in a perfect harmony. Tengen Uzui has the green and red theme, very much like Christmas. So in order to achieve the color combination, we're using the green ray skin and the red Ito wrap to accomplish the effect. Once the ray skin is perfectly glued onto the wood, it's time to wrap Uzui's sword. One of the key points about wrapping the handle is to make sure that the crisscross are alternating. The one on top has to go match to the one on the bottom, so these two have to be underneath, and then you continue that all over. You can't have this, this, this. They have to do that. Deleting in the following chord, right, Matt? Yeah, make sure you do that. Never that. Well, this build is turning out absolutely epic. If you agree with me, don't forget to hit that like button. Ilya and I have both debated back and forth whether or not we were going to actually etch the pattern on this blade. Traditionally, kitchen knives and katana blades alike would be polished on stones to reveal the hata or the layering, the pattering. And what we decided is we're just going to use a little fair chloride in the final stages of the hand polishing to give it a little more of a striking reveal of the pattern because we know you guys like to see it.
One of the last stages in making this sword is to put the characteristic kanji on the side. Uh, so I put a piece of paper on the anvil to prevent too much scratching and use the signing chisel to outline the kanji that say destroyer of demons or sushi. I'm not sure. One might notice that I'm not using my hammer and chisel in the way like a traditional horimono is made. I'm not removing material and carving it out. What I'm doing is employing a technique that is designed for May signature that's usually on the tank. So I take a chisel that is a completely different geometry and push in the grooves, thereby outlining that signature.
Well, I hope you enjoyed our second Demon Slayer build, Uzui Sword. If you want to check the first one, Tanjiro's Katana, follow this link. Awesome.